আসসালামাইকুম সুপ্রিয় দর্শক মন্ডলী শুভ সন্ধ্যা আমাদের অগ্রজ অনুষ্ঠানে আপনাদের সবাইকে সুস্বাগতম আজকে আইপিডিসি অগ্রজের দ্বিতীয় পর্ব এবং এই মাসটা তাৎপর্য তাৎপর্যপূর্ণ মাস বাঙালি জাতির জন্য অগাস্ট মাস শোভাবহ অগাস্ট এই মাসে আমরা হারিয়েছিলাম আমাদের জাতির পিতা বঙ্গবন্ধু শেখ মুজিবুর রহমান এবং ওনার পরিবার আমরা ওনার এবং ওনার পরিবার বর্গের রুহের মাতফারাত কামনা করছি এই বলে আমি এখন আপনাদের সঙ্গে পরিচয় করিয়ে দিতে চাই আমাদের এই দ্বিতীয় পর্বের আজকের আমাদের বিশিষ্ট মেহমান আর উনি হলেন প্রফেসর রেহমান সুবান উনার অনেক পরিচয় অনেক কিছু বলা যায় এবং উনার সম্বন্ধে যখন আমরা আমি রিসার্চ করতে গেলাম আমরা রিসার্চ করতে গেলাম দেখি ম্যাসেজ অফ ইনফরমেশন কোনটা বাদ দেবো কোনটা নিয়ে আসবো আমরা বুঝতে পারছি পারি নাই স্ট্রাকচারিং দি কোয়েশ্চেন তারপর আমরা খুব খুশি যে স্যারকে আমরা এই মাসে আনতে পেরেছি বঙ্গবন্ধুর প্রয়াণ মাসে এই স্যার বঙ্গবন্ধুর খুব ঘনিষ্ঠ সহযোগী ছিলেন স্পেশালি আফটার দি লিবারেশন অফ বাংলাদেশ ইকোনমিক সাইড আমি এই চেয়ে বেশি কথা আর বলতে চাই না আমি শুধু এইটুকু বলতে চাই স্যারকে আরেকবার ধন্যবাদ জানাই যে স্যার কষ্ট করে আমাদের এই প্রোগ্রামে এসছেন এটা আমাদের জন্য সম্মানের ব্যাপার এবং স্যার থেকে এক বেসিক্যালি আমরা জানতে চাই স্যারের লাইফ সম্বন্ধে স্যারের এক্সপিরিয়েন্সের সম্বন্ধে এবং এটা আমাদের প্রয়াস এই জন্য যে আমাদের যে ভবিষ্যৎ যে প্রজন্ম যারা স্যার সম্বন্ধে জানে না বা পুরোপুরি কিছু জানে না স্যারের মতো অনেক বিশিষ্ট ব্যক্তিবর্গ সম্বন্ধে জানে না তাদের সম্বন্ধে জানতে পারে আমি প্রথমে যেটা জানতে চাই নাচুলি স্যার অ্যাবাউট ইউর ফ্যামিলি আপনার নিজের সম্বন্ধে আপনার কোথায় জন্মগ্রহণ করেছেন কবে অ্যাবাউট ইউর প্যারেন্টস তারপরে আপনার ওয়াইফ প্রফেসর রনক জাহান তারপরে আপনার ছেলে জাফর সুবান আপনার ভাই অ্যাম্বাসেডর ফারুক সুবান এবং ইন লস অ্যান্ড গ্র্যান্ড চিলড্রেন তাদের সম্বন্ধে এনি ইন্টারেস্টিং অ্যানিকডোটস অ্যান্ড এক্সপিরিয়েন্সেস অফ ইউর চয়েস well of course uh, i have written in my memoir that uh, the real story of my life was that i began life in a very privileged circumstances uh, my uh, father was in the imperial police service uh, and uh, he spent a lot of his uh, serving life in kolkata Uh, I think uh, when I was very young or he was being, before I was born, he served in the Mufasal areas, but I grew up in Calcutta. And of course, uh, my mother was from the Dhaka Nawab family. And so the normal expectation of my life would be for people in my class to go through the standard uh, uh, English medium education uh, and to then sort of end up either competing for the civil service exam or in fact uh, joining an international organization or becoming like yourself a business executive in fact i had interviews with uh, after i came back from cambridge with uh, if i'm not mistaken ici and one or two others and they in fact actually offered me covenanted posts at that time but i had decided i was not going down that road but nowadays with in fact quite a lot of uh, boys from Bangladesh actually go to St. Paul's actually in my days. Uh, when I first went there, there were hardly too many Indians, a much smaller proportion of Muslims. And within that, an even smaller proportion of people from what would in fact constitute Bangladesh. So I spent nine years in life in uh, boarding school. It was very tough. Uh, you went and spent nine months in the year for Bangladesh. march up till the end of november and uh, and it tended to be very cold it tended to be uh, rainy throughout i was very fond of sports uh, so i got my colors in football hockey boxing athletics uh, and i was reasonably good in study so i was in those days what would be classified as a all rounder and uh, i thoroughly enjoyed my life uh, not everyone does my younger brother farooq 
joined me at the age of six. I was his guardian, but I don't think I was a very good guardian. <laughs> That's what he would tell you. But certainly, uh, he became my area of responsibility. And uh, then uh, we. How old were you, Chhoto? Farooq Sohan. Farooq is exactly five, five and a half years younger. जूनियर स्कूल and i then finished in 9 years so i began in 42 that was in the time of the british war a british rule and the second world war was still going on in those days in uh, war time life was even tougher amar chai modde kono chini dituna because uh, everything was subject to rationing food was both inadequate and not very tasty Uh, so we were always hungry, even though you were meant to be going to a good class boarding school. And uh, I moved, as I said, from a young boy in short pants when I came up there to a school prefect when I left. And as I said, being a color holder and games, and then getting the first class in my senior Cambridge. Uh, so that was uh, up to 1950. So I've written that I began my life singing. God save the king. When I left school, we were singing Jono Gono Mono because I was then uh, uh, part of the state of India. I see the name Salman Isfahani actually appearing on the screen. Uh, his uh, uncle, I would be, it would be Iski Isfahani. Yes, sir. Was in fact also in Saint Paul's. He of course became one of the leaders of the jute industry in uh, East Pakistan. But in those days. he was a very good sportsman in fact he was a color holder in football and hockey and was one of the best players in those two areas uh, but he was some years older than me at that time so sir speaking about national anthems what you just said means that you are a champion in the national anthems you have had have had four national anthems yes exactly i was about to say because when i went to ashison college Uh, to do my hsc you could not do it in st paul's in those days uh, because they in fact had discontinued doing the hsc exam and so if i wanted to do the next uh, two years after senior cambridge it needed to be a place hsc so hsc was a very different type of place it was a college which was built for the big chiefs and zamindars of uh, northern india in fact it was no it was one of several of what came to be known as chiefs colleges which the british had set up at that time uh, on the lines of public schools but in fact as someone described the chiefs colleges they were designed by the british to convert uh, barbarian indian princelings into english gentlemen and so uh, the class of people i met over there were people who owned cars and who bought their own horses to send for to their in fact zahiruddin actually uh you from your business community he was in both st paul's and then he went to hsn and in hsn uh he of course was a champion horse rider and also a very good long distance runner the way in which zahiruddin expanded in size later in life it would be difficult to imagine that in fact at once once upon a time in his life he was a very good athlete and horse rider uh, but um, hsn then was another experience and there were very few bengali boys in hsn and of course the uh, 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 the upper class zamindar background uh, punjabis and pathans over there tended to sort of look down on Bengalis they treated Bangladesh as a sort of colonial possession, and of course, when they tried to sort of demonstrate their superiority, one of the first things they had to do was to put them in their place. And I was uh, very good in those days at doing that, so I made some very harsh remarks to them when they tried to talk to me in that way in the beginning, and I think that ended it. And of course, 
once you settle into a school, it is one of the traditions of the uh, public school tradition, which has come down from the British, that you, if you are good in games, then many, uh, many of your sins are forgiven and many of your difficulties are solved. So in HSN, I could also get my colors in hockey and also in athletics. And uh, I, of course, also did quite well in my studies there. I was the top of the list in the HSC exams over there. Uh, but it was a different life. I mean, in St. Paul's, I remember we would sleep in dormitories uh, where there would be maybe about 50 or 60 people sleeping side by side in a dormitory. But when I went to HSM, in fact, I, as a HSC student at the senior level, I had a suite of rooms, I mean, meaning a bedroom, uh, 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 a dressing room and a bathroom. I mean, that doesn't give the impression of luxury. The rooms were very austere, but at any rate, for the first time in my life, I had the luxury of, in fact, having a room to myself. They were very functional, I'm sure, sir. So yeah. before we move on to your, the next stage of your education, that's in Cambridge, I will hark back uh, to your family, sir. So just a few words about your own family. Well, uh, my, as I said, my uh, father was in the Imperial Police Service. Uh, he then, in fact, uh, resigned from the service at the time of partnership. And in fact, uh, uh, decided when the new Pakistan came into existence, uh, that he should go into business. In fact, uh, he holds the distinction of setting up the first modern tannery in East Pakistan. In East Pakistan. In fact, the, he was the first Bengali to actually set up an industry even before A.K. Khan. But unfortunately, he wasn't a very good businessman because his whole tradition was uh, service and bureaucracy. And, never had his heart in it. but So that's why I didn't end up becoming a businessman, though he wanted me to become one. In fact, after my HSC, he sent me to in, in England to, in fact, uh, take training in the leather business so I could come back and run his business in Dhaka. Uh, but uh, as I have written, I had other ambitions, uh, but uh, that only came later. Uh, uh, my uh, brother Farooq, of course, had also followed me uh, to boarding school, as I told you. He went, came to Ageston, but he didn't like it. And so he ended up going to Burn Hall in Abbottabad, uh, where the climate was also cooler. And he was there for a very long time. And from Abbottabad, he then went to Queen's College uh, in Oxford. Uh, so that was his background. And then he took the competitive exam and then got into the foreign service. Uh, but in my case, uh, of course, as I said, when I went to England in 1953, uh, I had originally gone to take training in the leather business. Uh, but eventually, uh, both my cousins, Kamal Hussain and Besar Murshid, were going on for their higher education. Kamal Hussain had stood first in the intermediate in Dhaka from Notre Dame College. And Notre Dame was so impressed with him that they gave him a full scholarship to go to Notre Dame University. And he went there at the age of 16 and did his uh, BA. And he also told me, why am I wasting my time in the leather business? And Kaisar Murshid was became foreign secretary later. Uh, went to Oxford uh, in uh, 53. He also told me, why am I wasting my time? So I decided to apply, but I could only get in by sheer accident uh, because the only reason why I could get in was that my nana, Khaja Nazimuddin, who had been prime minister of uh, Pakistan and governor general of Pakistan, in fact, uh, had gone to the college where I applied uh, in before World War I. And so uh, when, they, uh, when he became prime minister of Pakistan, they elected him as a honorary fellow of the college. So he wrote a letter of recommendation, and I didn't think that it would be worth very much because he was now an ex-prime minister. He had been deposed 
by Ghulam Muhammad and Ayub Khan. Uh, and uh, at that time, I took a chance and sent in my application just when the school academic term had begun. So no one in their wildest dreams thought I could ever get in. But I got a letter asking me to come and meet the head of the college. And they told me they were admitting me. So I thought that how was this possible? And I concluded uh, that the reason why they admitted it is that because they honored my Nana when he was a prime minister, to deny his request when he is no longer a prime minister would by British standards of decency and culture be seen as bad manners. Absolutely, sir. Right here, please. That's right. So that's how I was able to get into Cambridge in uh, October of 1953. What did you study there, sir? I studied economics. In yeah. Cambridge, uh, you, uh, strangely enough, they had no discipline of politics. In Oxford, you could study a multidisciplinary course of politics, economics, and philosophy. But in Cambridge, you had to choose. And so I chose economics. And of course, uh, I was uh, uniquely privileged because not only did they have some of the best economists in the world teaching at Cambridge, but my in my generation, I had a unique collection of uh, economists, all from the South Asian region. Uh, Omurto Sen was... There we both came up the same year, though he came up a year, he was a year senior to me because he had come with a degree from Presidency College. And then uh, the other person who was with me was uh, Mehboob al uh, He also came with a degree from Government College in Lahore. And then I had uh, Jagdish Bhagwati, he's now one of the leading economists in the United States. Then, of course, Manmohan Singh was there. He came. Uh, a couple of years after me, even though he's older than us, he had in fact uh, done a degree in Punjab University and had already begun teaching before he came to Cambridge. That was a very distinguished company, sir. I yes. also understand, sir. That exceptionally uh, unusual and distinguished generation of people, but so, some of them were exclusively interested in economics. Not, uh, I was interested in economics, but I had very strong political inclination. So I was attending the uh, Cambridge has all these political societies. So I would go there and I had a number of friends who were very uh, left wing in their orientation and we would go there and play an active role. And then we got involved with the Cambridge Majlis. This was a South Asian facility in the sense that it was open to uh, Indians, Pakistanis, and that Spain. was what I was thinking, sir. How the name Majlis came in yeah. Cambridge. So now but, you. Actually it's a very ancient organization going back to the 19th century, and people like Jawaharlal Nehru and others had been members of the Majlis. So uh, I went in there, and eventually I was elected the president. Uh, in the year that I was president, uh, Omar Tosen was the treasurer of the organization. And uh, we organized debates on all sorts of subjects. We debated the conservative society of Cambridge. I remember on the subject of should, uh, uh, should Pakistan join into the pacts with the United States and the Western countries like the Baghdad Pact in Seattle, we were very critical of that process. The British conservatives were very supportive of it. And uh, we, in that sense, played a very active political role. I collaborated with the Arab society and the African society. We set up what was known as the Bandung Society, which was the forerunner of the non-aligned group. And we got all these students together to, in fact, uh, hold meetings. So I became much more politically oriented when I was in Cambridge. I, when I went to Cambridge, I can't say that I was politically very conscious. Uh, HSN even, I was more interested in sports and social life. And of course, just doing well in my studies. So, sir, uh, we may now move into another uh, area. Uh, we are very eager to learn about your teaching career at Dhaka University, which I also had the privilege of attending. My first <laughs> class was in September 1974. And it was on jurisprudence taken oh. by no other scholar 
than Professor Salma Subhan. Oh, I see. All right. I have wonderful memories of her teaching me, and I was her favorite student. I still remember. Oh, oh. Then, coincidentally, again, in retrospect, Professor Ono Jahan was my teacher in political science, which I had chosen as a subsidiary subject. Mm -hmm. She also taught my wife, Minu, who majored in political science. Really? Thus, the personal note is quite an interesting and pleasing juxtaposition of events for me and my spouse with you, sir, and your family. Okay, thank you. I'm happy to establish that link. And now we would like to hear about your arrival in Dhaka at the Dhaka University and your experiences with doyans like Professor Nurul Islam and Dr. Eman Huda and any other leading economist that you may wish to talk about, sir. Well, uh, the interesting point is that uh, when I was uh, at the end of my stay in Cambridge, when I had quite good results. In those days, the results of the Cambridge exams used to be published in the Times newspaper. Uh, the Oxford and Cambridge results are published. And this was read by a professor of economics in Peshawar University. Uh, uh, he was a Canadian, I remember. And he wrote to me and offered me my first job as a reader. Now they call it associate professor in the Department of Economics at Dhaka University, at Peshawar University. And he offered me a salary of 800 rupees a month in 1957 for a 21-year-old person. That was not a bad salary in those days. Uh, but at that time, I had decided uh, more on faith and political ideology than for any rational reason that I will make my life in Bangladesh. And so I thanked him and then said, I'm going back. When I came back, my father wanted me to take the competitive exam. He'd given up the idea that I would run his business. And he even suggested I join a multinational company. But I decided that I'm going back to Dhaka. So when I arrived in Dhaka, I first applied for a position in the East Pakistan Planning Board, because the Awami League was then in power in the provincial as well as at the national level. Atar Rahman was the chief minister and Bongabandhu was the minister for commerce, labor and industries. So uh, when I went to the planning department, uh, I uh, thought I would be able to get in very easily but the bureaucratic procedures were very uh, complicated and it, I kept on waiting and waiting for the procedures to exhaust themselves. So at that time, Dr. Nurul Huda, who was a part-time member of the commission while he was a teacher at the university, or chairman of the economics department, he said that vacancies are going to be created in the economics department while you come and uh, join and apply. I don't know whether you will get it here or not, but if you are politically inclined, this is the best place to be also. So, uh, <clears throat> I applied and I was appointed there as a senior lecturer because I had a foreign degree. And uh, I joined with Professor Anisur Rahman and Muzaffar Rahman and uh, Maksud Ali and Nanaba, whether the very able uh, young men who, of course, have all matured into very distinguished people. Uh, we were all the newcomers in the university. So the first, uh, I was assigned to take a class to begin with in the first year honors class, because I was a new teacher. And uh, in my first class, when I went in, because they were coming in as first year honors students, we had uh, Fakhruddin Ahmed, uh, Mirza Aziz Islam. Uh, there was another person uh, by the name of Saeed Ahmed who became a CSP. They were the three who got first classes. And of course, Professor Yunus, he didn't get a first class, but he got a good second class. So that was my first batch. QK Ahmad, I think, was also. Was also sir, Hassan, Taufik, Imam, and Ayub Rahman. No, then I'm coming to that. Then for some reason, uh, which I didn't expect, uh, Dr. Huda asked me to teach uh, also a class in the MA final uh, on uh, what was then known as monetary theory. Now, I had studied monetary theory in Cambridge, but you do not expect in your first uh, year as a teacher to teach an MA class. 
And in that class, of course, was H.T. Imam and Ayub or Rahman and a number of other people who were mostly my age. They were then 21, 22. I was then just 22 years old. And uh, so that was my occasion to teach them and to be their first teachers. Uh, and uh, from then on, I carried on teaching up to 1971. This was I, all these generation of people, Farashuddin, Mirza, uh, 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 Mohir, Mohir, uh, Abu Abdullah, uh, all these people from year to year, uh, they all were my students at that time. In those days, uh, the economics department tended to attract the cream of the people who wanted an arts degree. And so I had these people who were all excellent. Uh, most of the best students were all very left-wing and chatro union oriented. So those, were the, those were the signs of the times being left. That's right. And uh, so uh, they would all, I was then also beginning to speak out and write on issues relating to economic disparity and on the issue of two economies. Uh, this was, I wasn't the only one. Uh, I was the one who, name got into the newspapers, but my senior teachers like Noodle Islam and others were already talking about this and writing about this. Noodle Islam had come back from Harvard with his PhD. Uh, he was then a uh, reader in the economics department and uh, I had heard about his reputation. He had always stood first. He had excellent results. And so we came to know each other from 57 and became good friends. Uh, but we were all in those days uh, in the economics uh, department addressing the issue of uh, disparity between East and West Pakistan. So I understand that the article that you wrote on two economists of Pakistan came out in the Pakistan Observer. And then you faced some challenging times because of writing that uh, letter. No, well, it wasn't. I didn't actually... What I had done was that I had been invited because then Pakistan was under martial law. Ayub Khan had taken over in 58. First, the politicians had been jailed. And then when they were released, they were banned from speaking in public. So the only people who could get heard were people like us who were willing to speak out. And of course, most teachers in a martial law regime were not willing to speak out either. They were willing to speak in seminars or they were willing to write academic papers, but they were not willing to write in newspapers or to make public statements. So I was invited to this big conference in Lahore uh, on uh, uh, the issue of national integration in which I wrote this paper on uh, what I argued was that uh, in fact, unless you address the issue of disparity uh, and uh, recognize that the country had two economies in one country, uh, you would then not really be able to solve these problems. And that uh, the main point I made was that if you don't address the issue of disparity, the country may break up. I had made this prediction in 1961. And the whole idea of six points I had made in that point was that uh, the way in which you address this problem is that you, in fact, give complete uh, policy-making autonomy uh, to the provinces, which mean, meant that all the issues that were mentioned in the six points, those were the sort of powers that would need to be given to the provincial government. So this was presented in a conference in martial law period, but I was very surprised because it was an academic conference uh, that Pakistan Observer somehow got hold of my paper and they then uh, published the paper uh, with headlines over two successive days and uh, reported my whole uh, conference paper. Now, it was a very academic paper, but the headlines was what everyone read. And this made me quite famous. And I was then only a teacher. And I was then only 26 years old at that time. Uh, so this was the interesting feature. And of course, then when I spoke at a conference in Lahore, in Dhaka, uh, on the same subject, again, I got a headline. But the interesting point was then that Ayub Khan was also visiting 
uh, Dhaka at that time. And when he was leaving uh, Dhaka, the press then said, "We all this talk is going on about two economies. What is your view?" He said, "No, I I say that Pakistan has one economy and so on." And then suddenly, next headline to his remark was, "Rahman Shubham says there are two economies." So here was President of Pakistan making one remark, and a junior teacher, age twenty six, of Dhaka University, making uh, being given equal headlines with him. Now, those were the times that people were wanting you to speak out and those who spoke out got attention. You are very brave, sir, and it's very admirable. And here is the book I would like to show our viewers, From Two Economies to Two Nations, My Journey to Bangladesh, Rehman Suban. I would request our readers to find a uh, copy of it and read it. And I will read it. I have not yet read the full of it. It's very interesting. Well, this is basically consists mostly of all my writings on this subject from 1961 up to 1971. So all the thoughts I had on this, including this speech which appeared in Pakistan Observer, is over here. Uh, so uh, as I said, once you start talking on this, then the politicians get to know you. So Bongo Bandhu sent for me. I remember in 1964 when he had decided to reactivate the Awami League. It had been previously put into suspension because they had become part of a national democratic alliance. But when Sohrawardi Sahib died, he then uh, began uh, restarted it and took over the leadership. So at that point, he was formulating the manifesto of the Awami League. And he sent for Kamal Hussain and myself to help him to give ideas on what should go into the manifesto. This is in 1964. I was still then not 30 years old at that time, and that was the first time I met Tajuddin. He had taken over as secretary, but Bongo Bandhu we had met several times because when Sohrawardi used to visit here, then we used to meet him through Mr. Sohrawardi, and um, Sohrawardi was well known. Because he was my uh, uh, Salma Subhan's uh, mamu, and also he used to go to Kamal Hussain's house in Bailey Road because Kamal's father was his physician. So we used to meet Bongo Bondu in his company quite regularly. But uh, this was when we first politically became in uh, we came in touch with Bongo Bondu. So uh, we know that about your contributions to the Six Point Movement, which led ultimately to the emergence of Bangladesh. So during the liberation war, while Bangabandhu was in prison in Pakistan, I understand, sir, that you became an ambassador plenty potentiary of the liberation government to the United States. Of America. Well, let me say a few things leading up to that, because it wasn't that, I mean, once Bangabandhu, once March, uh, Ayub fell, and then uh, in that period from 69 to 71, uh, Bongo Bondu and the whole party was released from prison and they were given the opportunity to contest elections by the Yahya regime. At that point, then he sought out Kamal and me. Well, Kamal was already very close to him because of the Agartada conspiracy case. and He was uh, one of the main lawyers who was, in fact, actually helping him in that. Uh, but uh, he reached out to me in from 1969, and we became quite close. We were he was consulting us on how we should deal with uh, operationalization of six points and incorporate that into the constitution and his policy agendas. And then he invited uh, myself and Nurul Islam and Anisul Rahman to join Kamal to prepare the manifesto for the 70 elections. So in those two years. We became much closer and politically involved with him at all stages, right up to the negotiations which went on with Yahya Khan in 1971. And so when the army began its genocide on the 25th night and um, uh, in, uh, took him into custody, uh, exactly to the day, day on the 25th night, he was taken into custody, and then the country was under curfew. And then curfew was lifted on the 27th of March. 
At that time, I left my house because some people came to me and said that they are killing teachers. You will be a fool to stay in your house. So I moved somewhere else. And that afternoon, after curfew was lifted, the same, uh, I think it was the colonel who had arrested Bongo Bondu, came to my house with soldiers and wanted to arrest me, but I was not there. I had left. So they were almost about to take my wife into uh, custody and host a hostage, which fortunately, uh, the Salman Isfahani's uncle, Ali Jun Isfahani and Amine Isfahani were living next door to me. And they knew the uh, senior officer as well, because General Yahoo was uh, married to Amine Isfahani's first cousin and used to come there. So they said, don't do that and let them remain in our custody. So I owe a big debt to them because of saving Salma and my three sons from being held as hostage for me. And then I could go across the border. And uh, the interesting story then was that uh, when I arrived in Agartala with Anis Rahman, uh, at that time we met some Awami League leaders, which included Mr. Siddiqui and Siraj ul Haq, the father of Anis ul Haq who were about to fly to Delhi with the chief minister of Tripura. Because all these people had landed up in Agartala, wanting arms, wanting shelter after the crackdown. And the government didn't know what to do with all these people. So they wanted to go to Indira Gandhi to get her guidance on how to treat these. And they took these leaders along. So when we arrived and we met Amar Siddiqui, I asked uh, Siddiqui Shab, uh, do you know anyone in Delhi? Because he said, I've never been to Delhi and I know nobody. So we knew people from the academic community, some who had now become advisors to Indira Gandhi. So I said, I will write a letter of introduction to you and this will give you some access. So he said, then you come along. So I went to Delhi and uh, then Omarto Sen was there. He immediately came and took charge of Anis and me and took me the day after I arrived in Delhi, this would be around the 1st of April, uh, to uh, some of the senior advisors of Indira Gandhi like uh, Ashok Mitra and Ian Dhar. And they took me to meet her principal secretary, who was meant to be the second most powerful person in India, uh, P.N. Haksal. And Anis and I were the first people to actually give a full and detailed briefing of what actually happened and the background to all the developments which had taken place. Because at that time, Mr. Tajuddin was still on his way to Delhi. So I was quite a role, sir, from your side. That's right. And so after I'd done that and Tajuddin had been arrived there and he met her, then I was I met Tajuddin and Amirul Islam. And I spent a few days with him. Uh, at that time, um, Amirul Islam was helping him to prepare the uh, declaration of proclamation of independence and the speech which he made to the world, uh, I think on the uh, 10th of April. I prepared that speech. And then at that time, we heard that the Pakistanis were going to seek aid uh, from uh, the World Bank and the US. So Tajuddin immediately said, go off and start a campaign to stop aid to Pakistan because they are going to use this aid to continue killing Bengalis. So we should launch a campaign. And uh, that's how I went uh, at that time. At that time, there was no formally constituted government. So I went simply on the authorization of Tajuddin. <clears throat> and uh, when I landed in the United States, uh, Muhit and Kibriya and Inayat Karim and others were still serving in the Pakistan embassy. They had not defected yet. So I was the only one in Washington at that time who could speak with an official voice saying that I'm speaking for this so-called government of Bangladesh, which has constituted itself. Uh, so I was being invited to meet the senators, to go on television, to go before the National Press Club. And the high water mark of my thing was that I was invited by a senior senator 
Senator Saxby, who hosted a lunch for me in the U.S. Congress, uh, where senior senators and uh, from both parties attended the lunch, uh, where I could, in fact, give a projection of the Bangladesh course to them. So again, I was thinking, I've written in the memoir, that there was I, a teacher of Dhaka University with no political standing, uh, relatively young. I was then, how old was I? I was then about 34. Uh, meeting with people who normally only meet with heads of state, but who were willing to give me a hearing for the cause of Bangladesh. So this was my role. I then met McNamara. I went and campaigned and I was active in the United Nations. I used to go to the consortium meeting in Paris to campaign at that time for the consortium meeting to stop aid to Pakistan. In fact, uh, our campaign was quite successful because throughout 71, uh, the Pakistan aid consortium pledged no new aid to Pakistan during that period. I mean, some of the aid in the pipeline went through. So this put them under considerable economic pressure, which was very helpful to us. Uh, and uh, it helped us also to counter the role of the Nixon government because we faced the terrible problem that the government of the most powerful country in the world, the United States, had chosen to back Pakistan in that conflict and to stand by them. And so the whole campaign, which was, of course, not just my work, but the whole Bangladeshi uh, political mobilization, which took place in the U.S. at that time, was designed to mobilize the ordinary people of the country and then also all the political establishment, the Senate and the, uh, and the House of Representatives, and to mobilize them to uh, support our campaign for stopping aid uh, and also for, in fact, getting recognition for Bangladesh. So this huge mobilization took place, which is probably one of the most successful mobilizations yes. attempted by any country. And that was very awesome, sir. Very successful role that you played along with your, our other, your other compatriots at that time. So we'll now move in that Bangladesh has now become independent. And Bangabandhu is back and you are back and you are working on the detritus of the war that we faced, total destruction and deprivation. And we would like to know your interactions with Bangabandhu uh, at that time and your work in, you know, restarting the ravaged economy? Well, as I said, I came back, I got back to the country uh, on New Year's Eve of 1971. Uh, and of course, Bongo Bondu was still in custody. No one knew what his fate was. Uh, and of course, we only knew that he was coming back to the country uh, when he was on the plane from uh, uh, from uh, uh, Pakistan flying to London with, in, with Kamal Hussein because he also had Kamal Hussein released from custody and brought with him. So <clears throat> at that point then, uh, when the moment he came back, uh, Nurul Islam and myself uh, went to meet him and uh, he then uh, met us the day, the uh, little uh, uh, the day after he was sworn in as the Prime Minister. And he immediately told Nurul Islam that he was appointing him as uh, uh, Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission. And he told me he was appointing me as the member of the Planning Commission along with Anisa Rahman. Uh, you have uh, interviewed, uh, you have had a meeting with Mutiul Islam. In fact, Mutiul Islam was at that same meeting. He had asked him to come. And at that point, he told Matthew Islam he was appointing him the finance secretary. So we both had this shared experience of being uh, given our appointments by Bongo Bondu. We were a bit, uh, but we did, thought he would reflect on it and talk to his colleagues about it and so forth. But we said, no, I've decided you should uh, do that. And I want you to come in. And um, I, uh, my goal is to, in fact, establish a progressive socialistic economy for Bangladesh and I want you to play uh, the planning commission to play an active role in this. Of course, the ideological part of it was 
a more complex issue. The reality was that you were facing when we became, we joined the planning commission, you were setting up an organization which didn't exist. In fact, the real challenge was <coughs> that no organizations which constitute a functioning central government existed. There was no central bank. There was no National Planning Commission. There was no National Board of Revenue. There was no foreign ministry. None of the organizations, were, all these had to be set up out of nothing. And they had to be set up in a situation in which you had a war devastated economy. <clears throat> the whole infrastructure had been destroyed. 10 million or even more people were displaced and homeless. They had to be rehabilitated. The economy was at a standstill. There were zero food stocks. There were zero foreign exchange reserves. In all these circumstances, you had to go through a process of both building up an independent government in its institutions and also rehabilitating the economy. And this was all being done by people who had no real experience of government. Because apart from Bongabundu, who had spent a short period as a provincial minister, no one in his cabinet had actually any experience of government. And many of our senior civil servants were still uh, held captive in uh, Pakistan at that time because they were serving the central government. So we had to operate with these circumstances. And I think the big problem was how to we activate the economy. Uh, I don't know how many of you people, including a banker like yourself, are aware of the fact that uh, the whole economy of East Pakistan and what constituted the private sector was entirely controlled by the uh, Pakistani business elite, the Maimans, the Oras, the uh, these people were all the Chinyotis. They had dominated every sector of the economy. So that 90% uh, of the industry, uh, most of the banks, most of the insurance companies, the international and domestic trade in land, water transport, even the major retail establishments were controlled in one form or the other by these people. And virtually all of them, as it liberation approached, locked up their establishments, emptied out their bank accounts, or had taken overdrafts, uh, had zero inventories left in the factories, had let the machinery run down, and had disappeared to Pakistan. Uh, so the big challenge was how to actually revive uh, economy where you had a huge vacuum which had been created. And we had to take over these industries. Uh, we bought in in those days, and uh, whatever uh, people aren't familiar with this, but we bought in all the top executives at that time, whether for who had served in PIDC, like people like Dr. Momin, and businessmen like Mr. Dilawar Hussain and CM Murshid and others who had been bought in from the private sector. And similarly, the banks, I mean, all these, we bought in all the top professional bankers, all the top professional people from the insurance. So this was one phase in which all these uh, enterprises were being run by professionals. And we were trying to ensure that they would be given the commercial autonomy and independence to, in fact, actually run this. The big challenge was that uh, it is not easy to do that because bureaucrats also have their idea that they should, the tradition was that the bureaucrats controlled everything and that professionals were their subordinates. Our view was that it's the professionals who should in fact be given complete charge. They should be accountable only to their ministers. So this tension went on throughout the regime, but we did set up all these industries. We ran the banks, we ran the insurance companies, we restored production to pre-269, uh, 70 levels in most of the sectors. These were uh, some of the results which emerged under very, very difficult circumstances because there were the constant law and order problems, etc., which had to be there. So that was a great role that you played in trying to revive the economy. And that allowed a few years later 
after all the work you had done for us to join the workforce, my generation, which is also now on the verge of retirement. Mm -hmm. Now, after all that has happened, we, I want to uh, move uh, two decades later, about 18 years later, when uh, General Ishad was deposed in the wake of the uh, democracy regaining movement by the people. Again, under the leadership of Chief Justice Harbour bin Ahmed, the caretaker government was formed for the first time. And you, along with very distinguished personalities of the country, you joined the caretaker government. And over there, I, we, and I understand that you framed certain rules and regulations and task forces. Would you please tell that to our viewers? Yeah. Well, I actually hadn't expected to join the caretaker government. In fact, I had been sitting with uh, Ishtiaq and Kamal Hussain and others, and we were suggesting names uh, to Shahabuddin for constituting the caretaker government. And I was then, I had gone off to Tokyo because I was a member of the board of the UN University. So I was attending the board meeting when I got a call from the cabinet secretary M.K. Anwar that I had been appointed to the caretaker government. So in, apparently the leaders had been asked to nominate people. So Sheikh Hasina and the left group of people had both come together and uh, nominated me to be one of the members of the caretaker government. So I had to fly back from Tokyo to become a member of this government. Uh, I wasn't very keen, quite frankly, to be a member. So when we came there, uh, Shahabuddin, who is a person of enormous integrity and decency, Kubi, in fact, uh, uh, our leader of the opposition later on now, uh, Begum Khalid Azia had made the famous remark once that uh, there is no neutral person in Bangladesh. The only neutral person are uh, Pago Lothoba Shishu. So I would have had added to that, the third person I could name would be Justice Chahabuddin. He was a genuinely non-political person. Absolutely. In that right. And he had no experience of government, but he had the integrity. And he told us that I'm not going to stay here a day over my scheduled time. I want to go back to the bench because he had got a commitment that after he relinquished the position, he could go back to being chief justice. So my mandate to all of you, and we were quite a high powered group of people, is that we are going to do nothing at all. Our only task is to hold a free and fair election. And you people should just sit at your desk <coughs> and do the minimum of file work. No policies, no action, no nothing. So when I went to take over the planning department mm. at that time, I was also given charge of the ERD, the External Relations Division for Aid Negotiations and uh, then also I took over the planning, the other portfolio of chairing the ethnic meetings. Anyway, when I went there, I thought that, my goodness, how can I spend three months doing nothing at all? Uh, I then became very active because Irshad had left a huge portfolio of projects which needed to be cleared and approved. So we were holding three and four ethnic meetings a week where you normally held one every week and to clear these projects. And then I thought that the next thing that we might try to do <clears throat> is that after so many years now, an elected democratic government is going to come in. Now, during this period uh, of the eight days, uh, virtually all policy making had been abdicated from the government. <clears throat> And the World Bank and the IMF were then simply bringing in consultants who were then the people who were guiding policies. And my view was that you've got so much talent in Bangladesh going to waste. Why can we not mobilize indigenous talent to in fact prepare a series of policy recommendations for the incoming elected government? So then I decided, let me reach out in these three months and see what we can do. So I decided to constitute 29 task forces addressing different aspects of the economy. Mm. In fact, I then reached out to uh, 
leaders from uh, different, uh, I mean, people who are, had different political leanings, uh, but who were professionally the best. People like uh, uh, Al Husseini, Iqbal Mahmood, uh, Fasiuddin Mehtab, uh, then uh, people like Wahiduddin Mahmood, and all sorts of the best professionals who were actually available at that time. And uh, I actually then reached out also to the members of each of the task force. In fact, I must have personally, we had altogether about 270 people sitting in the planning commission. I must have personally spoken to at least about 200 of them in order to persuade them to actually join the task force. And I said, we are going to be offered no salary. You are going to just be asked for the next uh, eight weeks or so to give your uh, full time to preparing policy recommendations for an incoming government. And I was amazed at the way in which they actually responded. In fact, it made me really proud to be a Bangladeshi, to know that there were so many top professional people who were willing to work day and night. Uh, or the only reward they were getting was a cup of tea and some biscuits when they were really attending meetings. And they worked and they produced these uh, 29 really outstanding reports uh, in this very short period of time. I mean, if you had given these to foreign consultants, it would have cost quite a few million dollars to in fact get work of that quality for tea and biscuits. And uh, my goal was then to uh, present it to the leaders of both the incoming elected government and the leader of the opposition. I had no idea who would be elected. Uh, we, everyone had their preferences, but we were not supposed to indicate that. So when, of course, the elections uh, emerged, I had got commitments, both from Saifur Rahman on behalf of the BNP and from Sheikh Hasina herself, who I met on account. I met, in fact, Khalid Azia also and told her that this is what I'm doing. I hope you will treat this as a work which is being done for the benefit of both parties, even though you think I may be associated with the Abhavi League, uh, but I'm doing it for everybody. So that was there. And the commitment they made to me was that when I would, the reports were ready, uh, I would then present it in a big uh, public function at the Planning Commission uh, to each of the two leaders who would come with their team. So that's a lot of lot of work, sir, that which you telescoped into a quarter of a year. And we are also now nearing the, uh, to the end of the time. So we'll have another about 20 minutes left. So I need to ask you a few more aspects of your life. First, I would like to ask you now about your vision behind setting up CPD. And how do you feel about it? Okay. Well, actually, it, CPD is related to the task forces. Because my experience with the task forces when I produced it was not good. Here was all this labor which had been invested. I had presented it for, to the government, which was then the BNP. They made no use of it at all, even though they had promised to do so. The only one who actually did use it, strangely enough, was uh, Sheikh Hasina. Because then I presented the work to her. Uh, she was then the leader of the opposition. And then she said, yes, I would like my members of parliament who were in the opposition to be exposed to this work. So she organized a three-day program in the uh, uh, parliament uh, in building in which the task force uh, conveners came and presented their reports to all the Awami League MPs who sat there actually like students uh, under the orders of their leader to in fact actually absorb uh, the recommendations. And I hope that they made good use of it whenever they were in parliament. But effectively the policy makers did not make any use of it. And so I thought that what a waste. I mean, here is all this work done. No one is using it. So I decided that what I wanted now was to set up a small group of people. And we could then invite all the political leaders from government and opposition, the business community, the uh, civil society people, the workers, 
who were all having a stake in policy making and they would in fact discuss major policy issues and i said that the first round of issues to be discussed is many of the issues raised in the task force reports so it was a, essentially an attempt to connect all the key players together with academic people and then discuss policy issues together and of course that's how it began it was a very modest venture uh, but it grew and of course when i handed over to devopriyo and mustafiz uh, they then made it into a much bigger organization we started preparing this uh, from 1995 this independent review of the state of the economy because at that time i found that virtually all the analysis of the economy was coming from the world bank every year they should prepare a gray cover report which was then presented to the consortium and anyone who wanted to know what was happening in the bangladesh economy had to look at the world bank report so i said we have got so many competent economists in bangladesh why should we be dependent on the world bank uh, so we took up the preparation of the independent review as we called it <clears throat> which has been coming out every year we prepare it uh, we use it uh, to and present it just before the budget then when the budget comes out we have a discussion on the budget drawing on the material of the independent review and this has gone on from 1995 up to 2020 i have had the privilege sir of attending the last 10 12 15 years essential was that once the irbd as we called it started coming out uh the world bank then stopped publishing its gray cover report this then became the central document around which a discussion should take place unfortunately up to recently all finance ministers invariably attended it said for rahman kibria mirza aziz al islam and even mr mohit uh during his first phase in the uh, as minister but Uh, recently they have seemed to be reluctant so we bring in the minister for planning uh, sir, but if we may move <coughs> on because of the time yeah, sir i'm sorry to stop you uh, you have you're quite a scholar and have authored multiple books which in your opinion is a more seminal work well i've done a number of major works throughout my life uh, the one of the most important ones was uh, which i had done uh is my first publication was on looking at the ayub regimes way in which they manipulated the major project the works program to use it as a political instrument for getting his re-election then the other major work i did was looking at the whole experience of uh, nationalization and the problems faced in really running the nationalized industries uh we did major research on that and came up with a lot of good empirical findings then i wrote another work uh crisis of external dependence on the whole history of how we became so dependent on foreign donors and how they were influencing our policies and how we needed to become independent from this process then the first works which were done on the debt default crisis today everyone is talking about it but i worked on this problem uh using material from the time of Ziaur Rahman and the first reports i published with young researchers like Sayed uh, Akhtar Mahmood and Ahmed Hasan who became big names in the world bank uh were done with no money uh and these people working with 400 files in Shilpo bank and Shilpurin Sonosta preparing the default crisis and we identified that unless you deal with this problem and you regulate and exercise discipline for debt recovery this will become a permanent problem and of course it is continued for the next what is it almost 35 years 40 years but we were the very first people to identify it even before the world bank chose to address this problem then i wrote another major work on agrarian reform i think in many ways it was one of my better works uh, when i was in oxford i also wrote about south south cooperation and at that time when the big 
surpluses were being accumulated by the oil exporters. I felt it could be better used in developing countries rather than being banked only in the United States. And that was another work. Then I later on wrote about uh, South Asian cooperation and about uh, uh, constructing the Silk Route uh, from Kunming up to uh, Peshawar and the economic advantages of that. And my most recent works, the ones which I've been doing, are on poverty and inequality. So this has been my main obsession over the last few years on addressing the uh, growing inequality in society and what you can do about it. Because me, my view is it isn't only enough to identify a problem. I gave a whole range of policy suggestions, both in the book, and then I did a smaller report identifying 60 different ways in which if you want to challenge poverty and inequality, what actions can be taken, not just in Bangladesh, but across the governments of South Asia. That has been my move. And of course, my last work has been my memoir. I have finished one volume, which you've seen. I'm now uh, sending to the press my second volume covering the years in the Planning Commission. And the final volume is also come up to the present day. is nearing completion. So I have one more book over here, Bangladesh Air Ubhuta. Oh. Very interesting. Achha. Okay, good. Thank That's you. The range of subjects you have written on, and these will remain relevant for a very, very long time. Uh, so we'll very now quickly move on to the last few questions. Uh, the, the last one, uh, the next one here is a little bit about your hobbies, actions, and interests, whatever it is. Well, uh, as I said, of course, uh, I have a wide range of interests. So I'm very, uh, but one of my great passions has been movies. I like to go, to go and watch movies. I inherited it from my mother. My mother was a great movie goer. And she used to go in Kolkata regularly to the movies. In fact, she started taking me with, with her to see movies from the time I was four years old. And I have retained her passion for movies. And uh, of course, uh, nowadays in Bangladesh, you cannot go to any movie house. So now they've got some multiplexes. So I've been once or twice. But uh, whenever we are uh, abroad, in New York when I'm there with no Ronak. I regularly go to movies and of course then we now watch movies um, uh, Netflix. Netflix and so forth. So uh, I'm a great authority on movies and yeah. I've been watching it virtually all my life. I'm very, I'm, I read a lot. I have a very big library. I'm interested in music and of course I'm very passionately interested in sports. Uh, so I've been watching football, cricket, athletics, boxing. I made a very interesting discovery. I mean, in, uh, when I uh, used to watch football from the time I was in St. Paul's, I used to play, but I used to also watch it. I was a great supporter of Manchester United. And then I found that your uh, banking colleague from Stan Chart Bank. Bijoy. I said Bijoy. Uh, Bijoy who is my next door neighbor, he is a great supporter of Liverpool. Liverpool. And in fact, actually even went to watch a match yes. recently in, uh, in uh, Liverpool. Okay. Uh, so I was very interested to hear that. So we, I stay awake to watch the matches. I stay awake to watch cricket and other sporting events. And of course, that again is there. I'm very fond of good food. Unfortunately for... Uh, as you become older and for medical and dietary reasons, you cannot fully indulge yourself. Uh, I think part of my health problems owe for, to the fact that I was very fond of good food. Fortunately, now that uh, Ronak is with me, she shares uh, many of my tastes. So she's fond of food. She's fond, but more disciplined than I am. So that is all very interesting, sir. So at this point, you mentioned Professor Ronak Jahan. Yes. Could you tell us a few words about her? Well, Ronak, of course, uh, was one of the most outstanding students of her generation. Uh, she stood, uh, got first classes throughout her life, got a government scholarship to go to Harvard. And by the age of 20, she was the first Bangladeshi woman to actually 
go to Harvard. And uh, she got her PhD at the age of 26. In fact, what people may not be aware of is that the topic of her PhD uh, on the issue of the failure of national integration in Pakistan, she in fact completed the thesis in 1970 uh, before uh, oh. the independence struggle. And he was then uh, given a fellowship by Columbia University to convert her thesis into a publishable book, which came out in 1972. So she had actually forecast the breakup of Pakistan because of its failure to integrate itself. And she gave a whole range of data and analysis of that in a very scholarly way. So that book is in fact become quite famous and it is read by every student of South Asian politics virtually from 1972 to the present. It has become the standard academic work on the emergence of Bangladesh. So he, she was a well-known political scientist. She came back uh, at a very young age. She became chairman of the political science department. She looked young, younger than she was, and uh, she began to be internationally recognized. So I, and I was I lucky to be asked, and I was lucky to be a student. That's yeah. right. So you would know, and of course she was very small in size and <laughs> young, but uh, she was a great terror in the university. So oh, she was. They were all afraid of her. Come to her to ask them to raise marks or to for admissions. She would scold them, even though they may have been sort of politically quite influential, and really sort of send them away. Very admirable, sir. Uh, very admirable. So, so now, she continued as a great scholar and then when eventually she spent time in the United Nations. She was heading programs in first in Kuala Lumpur and then with the ILO in Geneva. And then she began teaching in Columbia University for the last uh, 20 years. Very, very admirable, sir. So now a few words about your friends. Whom do you consider to be your very close friends? Well, unfortunately, I am of an age now where some of my closest friends uh, have been passing away. My closest friends, uh, strangely enough, have been my wife. In fact, Gronach was a very close friend before I married her when uh, I was with Salma. Uh, but amongst the others, uh, Professor Razak, he was a, not just a close friend, he was my mentor in many ways. And I learned a great deal from him. And another of my very close friends was Mr. Ziaul Haq, Tulumia, who is known to all the business community. He was a very exceptional person. And I wrote an article after he passed away that he was the one person who could bring everyone together in his drawing room where his wife, Jolly, would give them the best food. And they would then have these political discussions where no one else could bring them together. They would all come together and from the BNP and the Awami League and they would have negotiations in his drawing room. But as a human being, he was a very exceptional person. Then my other friends were people like uh, Moidul Hassan, who was instrumental in, in fact, getting me out of my house in 71 and in fact, uh, helping me to get across the border uh, and of course, I, then he was one of my students, in fact, going back to 19, uh, uh, 1958, 59. So these were some of them, and some of my relations have been the closest friends Kamal Hussein, my brother Farooq, uh, Habida, and I, who edited Forum, uh, and of course, uh, some others who have now passed away. Uh, Omar Tosen remained one of my closest friends. He's one of the few who survived. Uh, in fact, one of my closest friends from Darjeeling, my very oldest friend, who was a very successful businessman, just passed away uh, just after the COVID started. Mm. In fact, when I, I was attending a conference in Cambridge with Omar Tosen uh, in... Uh, in January, just a few months before. Mm. And uh, as I was leaving him, we were talking about the fact that we are the few remaining survivors of many of our friends and contemporaries. 
uh, and they are all passing away. Omarto is, in fact, uh, now about 87. I am 85. So when I was saying goodbye to him, uh, he said, I have one last message to you. Don't die. <laughs> Don't die, sir. Remain in good health. And before we go, sir, will you please give a message to our younger generation, the future caretakers of our beautiful country? Well, my last my message to you, and I've had several encounters with young people. I met a group in Cambridge uh, who are part of a youth forum. And then there's another group of people from Oxford and Cambridge who I've met recently in Dhaka. And my central message to you is that uh, those who were in Dhaka have come back to Dhaka. I mean, the big problem with young people of my generation is that we all came back. I mean, the notion in my case that I would ever make a living abroad didn't enter my mind. My view was that I was qualified and competent and I would spend my life for whatever I could is worth contributing what I could to the country. Now, a whole generation of people, particularly in the post-liberation people, then who were qualified, they came, they did work, and then they went out. And they spent the best years of their life out of the country. And so all these people of great quality and competence uh, who would have been of service to the country uh, were really not available to us. Now, it's a two-way problem because the problem is that you also have to create the motivation and inspiration for people to come back and want to be of service. Yeah. If that motivation and inspiration is not there, then uh, there are many more attractions to be out and disadvantages of being over here. But situation in many ways is better. Uh, place is more livable, opportunities are much greater. And so what one would look for is that the best and the most able should come back and make contributions in various ways that they can. There are many independent areas where you can, in fact, override what you may categorize as problems of uh, weak governance. And you can do in things on your own and be effective. And you can be of service. But whatever you do, you should remain conscious of the fact that you are, at the end of the day, a person who is very privileged by your education and your talents, and that you owe a debt to the people of this country uh, who have provided the resources and opportunities for you to have an education in the first place, and in many cases to go abroad. They are the ones who generate your foreign exchange earnings. They are the ones who are creating your competitiveness in the international export market. They are the ones who have quadrupled your food production. So you owe an obligation to these people. And your sense of achievement and your sense of self-worth will be greatly enhanced if whatever professional contribution you can make can be linked up with being of service to the country and particularly to the people who are the most sort of deprived and dispossessed. I mean, they are the biggest resource that we have. And if you, in fact, can invest your talents in their service, uh, then you can have double-digit growth, but you can also have a much more democratic, egalitarian, and just society. Fantastic, sir. Those are very valuable words, and I really like the double-digit growth that Bangladesh should aspire to in the very near future. You have spent considerable time with us, sir. We really value it. These will all be encapsulated in a volume and will later on publish what we have heard from you today. Thank you on behalf of IPDC and all the viewers who are seeing this or will be again be seeing this later on the recorded version. From all of them, a great note of thanks to you and of course to Professor Rana Jahan in supporting this. And we wish you good health in the wake of this pandemic. Stay well, sir. Stay healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So this ends the program over here. And uh, before I go, I would really like to thank all these viewers for watching this program for over one hour. Uh, 
IPDC, Momin al-Islam is the CEO who is the vision behind the show. I really recall his uh, uh, work in this and he is very bullish that we'll continue to run this program every month, the first Thursday and the third Thursday, and we'll continue to bring in builders of Bangladesh to you so you know from them how they have built Bangladesh and we learn how to build a greater Bangladesh, a double-digit GDP growth Bangladesh. People who have worked over here as Momin and his team from IPDC, uh, and then from uh, Creator is Rashid and Riyadh, and also from uh, the, uh, and then Tanvir also, the technical team headed by him all together. This has been a great evening. It really is a privilege to bring in Professor Riman Suwan to this uh, event, and we are most honored. And I wish all our viewers stay happy, stay healthy, stay safe. সময় নির্ধারণ করে দেয় আমাদের জীবন গতি এবং প্রবাহ বাংলাদেশ নামক বিস্ময়কর এই রাষ্ট্রের রূপকার অনেকেই আছে তাদের সেই অজানা কথা তাদের সেই না বলা কথা নিয়ে আমরা আসছি আইপিডিসির অগ্রজ নিয়ে আমি আনিসে খান আসছি অগ্রজদের নিয়ে চোখ রাখুন আইপিডিসি ফেসবুক পেজে আমরা থাকবো আপনাদের সাথে মাসের প্রথম এবং তৃতীয় বৃহস্পতিবার রাত আটটায়